All right, I have won. It's about time. I will finally talk about my portfolio. The community has been requesting it for years. And now after around three and a half years of me running this YouTube channel, I will finally reveal the current stocks in my portfolio. I'll discuss topics such as diversification, concentration, industry exposure, the risks of sharing your ideas publicly. I'll address some of the mistakes I made along the way. So I'm sure you will learn a lot if you stick around. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so I've got my coffee ready and I'm just going to ramble about my portfolio in just a second. But first, let me address why I haven't shared my portfolio so far. I think that's because it's a very fine line between, on the one hand, advantages you gain by sharing your portfolio publicly. In my instance, it would be the ability to gain critical feedback, to gain new insights by people who may be familiar with the name as well. Maybe gaining new viewers because I hope this video will do well on YouTube as well. And on the other hand, there is, of course, the risk of you being affected by psychological biases and the so-called commitment bias in particular. I think once you share an investment idea or a stock in your portfolio publicly, you will have a harder time selling that position eventually or changing your mind on it just because you have, quote unquote, committed to the idea publicly. So I'm very well aware of that risk. But when I was weighing the pros and cons, I have made the decision to finally discuss my portfolio. Yeah, and maybe just to wrap up this topic of why it can be risky to share your ideas publicly. Let me just read a tweet to you that I came across the other day. The author wrote, I think another aspect why contrarian investments are not that easy as they seem is that they are psychologically very demanding, especially when you publish your idea in public and it's a stock that is, quote unquote, emotionally loaded. Being bullish on matter in 2022 when everyone hated the company was not that easy as everyone had an opinion about the stock and why Zuck is such a bad CEO. That aspect didn't make it easier to make rational decisions, which is very important at contrarian investments in my opinion. So what this tweet is actually stressing the fact that it can be hard to be bullish on ideas that are, yeah, as highlighted, hated by the public. That's not necessarily the risk that I was stressing, but I think that's definitely another risk that can make it harder for you to make the best rational, optimal decisions. Okay, before we get to my actual portfolio, let me just clearly state that obviously this is not investment advice. You will have to understand that, first of all, my positions can change at any point in time. By the point I published this video, some of the positions might have already changed. Clearly, I'm a long-term investor. I tend to hold my positions for the long term. So chances are when this video goes live, the portfolio will look exactly the same. However, it happens. I sell positions, I trim positions to allocate some of the generated cash to new holdings or to different holdings. And maybe most importantly, just because the stocks are in my portfolio as of today, this doesn't mean that I would be a buyer at current levels. So if you do not understand the points I just made, you better stop watching the video right here. Yeah, and then maybe finally a last point on why copying blindly copying other investors can be so dangerous. Obviously, stocks tend to be rather volatile. And if you haven't built the or developed the conviction in an idea yourself, meaning you truly understand the long-term thesis of the underlying business, or maybe I should say the investment thesis because an investment may also rely more heavily on valuation than actually the business side of things. Well, if you haven't done the work yourself, you will likely make poor decisions when the stock moves in a volatile fashion. And in particular, when it moves down, is losing 30, 40, 50, 60% over a fairly short period of time. So again, if you don't understand the investment thesis yourself, if you don't have the conviction in an investment and still put money into that investment, that's basically a recipe for disaster. Okay, I promise we'll get to the portfolio in just a second, but I want to address a few more topics that I think can be quite educational or provide educational value as well. So first of all, what I will not do in this video is talk about my performance. And the main reason for this is not that I have performed poorly, now quite the opposite is the case, but I think publicly sharing your performance poses another risk that I don't want to expose myself to. Just tracking my performance myself, I've noticed that it puts some kind of pressure on myself to perform well over the short term. And in investing, one or two or even three years of investing performance can be considered short-term performance. And now talking about performance publicly on top of that, I think it will lead to poor decision-making on my behalf because every investor, the best investors in the world that compound at very high rates of return, they all will inevitably experience 
periods, shorter periods of one or two years where they underperform the market. What I can tell you right here is that my seven year track record is actually very good. But I think if I start talking about performance today, I will feel like I will have to talk about my performance in a year from now and two years from now. And maybe over that time frame, I will have performed poorly, which is absolutely normal. But I think it bears the risk of me making bad decisions I don't know, to catch up over the short term. Okay, and now we can finally take a look at my portfolio. So let me just show you a pie chart here that shows that in total, I currently have 13 investments. You can already see that I'm quite heavily concentrated in a few names. And I guess for most people, just having 13 names in your portfolio is already a very high level of concentration. And what I should say here is that I'm very concentrated by choice. In fact, I used to run a portfolio of less than 10 names, which I actually prefer, but I've added a few smaller positions in more recent history, which leads to 13 names in total. And why am I concentrated by choice? Well, I would argue that if you have, I don't know, say 25 names plus in your portfolio, maybe 30 stocks or more, you are likely playing a different game than I do. Of course, what I do is I put a lot of effort into researching the businesses that I have in my portfolio. And this research obviously takes time. And it also takes time to keep up with the businesses as soon as they are in your portfolio. And I would argue if you have 30 companies in your portfolio, there's no way you understand the businesses to the extent that is required for me to have a company in my portfolio. And on top of that, I would make the case that there are only so many good businesses trading at very attractive prices. So if you have 30, 40 names in your portfolio, chances are that you are not selective enough in your investment process and in your valuation work. What I should also say is that another factor that is not very often talked about is the concept of internal diversification, meaning that some companies are internally diversified because there are different subsidiaries within the companies in your portfolio. In fact, someone who owns just five stocks say one of the stocks is Berkshire Hathaway, may be more diversified than another investor who holds 10 stocks in his portfolio. All right, so far I haven't really revealed the names in my portfolio, so here's what I will do. Let me first show you the geographic diversification within my portfolio. So what I'm using here is actually a tool offered by Coifin. They recently added a portfolio manager and I recently played around with this tool, which kind of made me want to do this video here today. So what can we see here? Well, we can see that 62% of my portfolio names are headquartered in the United States and we have a 12.8% exposure to an Israeli company. We've got a 10.7% exposure to a Japanese company. Around 9% of the stocks in my portfolio are located in Germany. Then we've got a around 3% exposure to China and a 1.99% exposure to Italy. And from a sector point of view, around 55% of my portfolio can be attributed to the communication services sector. Between 18 to 19% operate in the information technology sector. Then we've got a 13% exposure to the financial sector. And finally, 13.14% of my portfolio's holdings can be categorized under the consumer discretionary umbrella. All right, and with that out of the way, let's focus on the individual stocks. What I should say is that obviously every single name in my portfolio would deserve its own video or maybe its own entire video series. I just talked about the due diligence that is required to actually understand a company. Obviously, that is not something I can do for 13 different names in the context of this video. What I'd like to do instead is to summarize my key investment thesis in one, two, maximum three lines. And the investment thesis, I should also say, is mostly not based on the price the stock is trading at, but rather a long-term outlook of the business and an assessment of the company's strength. And what I will do is I will go through all of the 30 names, give you a brief pitch. Again, pitch may be the wrong word here because clearly I'm not giving investment advice and I'm not a buyer of all of these securities at the current level. In fact, I would not buy most securities I have in my portfolio right now at the current prices. Because at the end of the day, investing is a game of opportunity cost. And finally, let me just say that I will start with the smallest position and then work my way up to the biggest position in my portfolio. All right, starting with the smallest position, which can be in a way considered a startup position. It's Brockhouse Technologies, a company that I very recently added to my portfolio. And here's my quick thesis on the company. I note it down. It's a company run by an excellent management team with a long two-decade track record in the private equity space. It's 
a founder-led business. The CEO actually owns 20% of the company. And in a nutshell, it's a bet on management's capital allocation skills. Management is quite clear and vocal about their long-term vision. They want to build a serial acquirer. One of their role models is Roper Technologies from the United States, which since its IPO in the early 90s, I think, has gone up 100x or, or even more. As of today, the company is trading at an earnings multiple of around 17. It's quite a tricky and complex investment, I have to say. There are a lot of accounting things going on that I had a hard time wrapping my head around. But considering the operational performance of the business, I think the valuation isn't all too demanding. The company's management team is actually guiding for good growth in the coming two years. And hopefully the management team will also find some attractive acquisition targets in the coming month and years because as of today it's not really a serial acquirers i noted down it's a phase zero serial acquirer because they only have two subsidiaries under the holding company brockhaus technologies all right moving on to the second smallest position in my portfolio which in a way should also be understood as a starting position this company is called the italian c group as of today this stock represents two percent of my overall portfolio value and the thesis I noted down is that this is essentially a luxury play. It's a play on luxury yachts more specifically. So the Italian C Group is combining some iconic brands under its group name. It's also a founder-led company that is somewhat recession resistant. I think the company has room for margin expansion. There are secular tailwinds mainly due to the growth in the number of high net worth individuals. A not so insignificant part of the business's revenue actually stems from its refit segment for both its own and third-party boats, which can be considered less cyclical than its main yacht sale division. Then another name in my portfolio is still Alibaba, an investment that hasn't gone well for me so far. I should say that I actually trimmed Alibaba on two occasions already, allocating some of the cash that I generated by selling some of the shares I owned. Well, I used that cash to invest in new or already existing positions at maybe equally attractive prices, but I still own Alibaba. So there is a reason why it's still in my portfolio. One of the reasons may be that Alibaba may be located in one of the most hated geographies for investors at the moment in China. I would argue that the US and China are actually too entangled in the world economy for them to actually have a full on war against each other. So. To be honest, I'm not really overly worried about this. And clearly Alibaba possesses a mode, mainly an infrastructure mode. It's the Chinese e-commerce king. I think part of the Alibaba thesis at current prices is that Alibaba is quite heavily buying back shares. I think in the most recent quarter, they actually bought back close to 5% of the total shares outstanding in just a single quarter. I think those numbers alone are quite staggering. Alibaba also initiated a dividend. So I think the fact that Alibaba is using real cash to pay dividend to buy back shares shows that investors actually do own a stake in the company and I think at the current price Alibaba is just damn cheap. All right next up we've got PayPal. I've actually done a video on PayPal not too long ago and that has done quite well so make sure to watch this video as well if you are interested in this name. Well my two or three line pitch for PayPal is the following. It's an inflation hedged business model. The company shows decent growth it's operating in a very attractive industry, the payment industry. Uh, obviously, PayPal, the brand, is recognized all around the world. The company now, now has a new CEO with Alex Chris, and he might reinvigorate a culture of business innovation. Obviously, PayPal has access to a lot of, lot of data that they may start leveraging in the future. The Venmo brand is very popular among younger generations. And I think there's a lot of room for margin expansion at their white label brain free business, which Alex Chris actually hinted at in some of the most recent earnings calls. And on top of this, Alibaba isn't trading at an all too demanding valuation. Quite frankly, I don't have the conviction in the long-term thesis here to make the position bigger, but I think having some exposure to PayPal at the current price, and I should also say that I was quite lucky in my investment here, pretty much timed the bottom. I think my cost basis for PayPal is around 51 dollars and a few cents. So I've already done quite well with that investment so far. All right, then another German name in my portfolio. I should have said that Brockhaus Technologies is also a company operating in Germany. Another German name is Mr. Specs. What I should say is that I think people who watch my videos regularly understand that I try to focus on ultra high quality companies trading at fair prices. 
Clearly, Mr. Speck is not a high quality company. In fact, I would argue that it is by far the lowest quality company in my portfolio. So why do I own Mr. Specs? Well, I would argue that Mr. Specs is more of a valuation play. The company is pretty much trading at net cash value. It seems like the company is now at an inflection point trying to turn profitable. The company was actually profitable on an operating cash flow basis in the most recent quarters. But I also have to admit that the company is struggling to really get truly profitable. That's actually an activist investor who recently acquired a 3% stake in the company and I hope he can put some pressure on management. Mr. Spex is actually also a company that is still run by its founder. I've listened to a bunch of interviews with him and I think he seems like quite, quite a trustworthy person. And in fact, Mr. Spex is gaining market share in Germany and I think they still have a long runway of growth left ahead of them. And part of my investment thesis here is that if Mr. Spex can get to a profitability that is just half as good as the profitability of a well-known competitor, especially in the German market, Fielmann. The company is just too cheap. But what I should also say here is maybe that I'm kind of losing conviction in this investment thesis here, kind of have my doubts whether management can really turn profitability mode on. Even though the eyewear market is generally speaking an attractive market, especially prescription classes tend to have decently high cross margins. But for a couple of reasons that I will not be able to discuss in this video, I kind of have my doubts whether Mr. Specs can really achieve the profitability metrics that I was mentioning earlier. All right, then another position in my portfolio is Endor, another German name. And I have to say that I lost a lot of money with that investment. I think the thesis here is that Endor is the market leader in the sim racing space, which is a growing industry. So there are definitely secular tailwinds at play here. I think the sim racing industry will only become bigger once the metaverse becomes more of a thing. They have by far the biggest ecosystem of all the players in the sim racing space and there's definitely some stickiness to their ecosystem. However, a lot of things have gone wrong at the company over the last couple of months and, and maybe the last two years. And I addressed a few of these things in a, in a longer tweet, so make sure to read it in full. And I guess my biggest learning from this investment that has kind of gone wrong, but let's see how it turns out over the long term. I'm still holding it. Well, the biggest mistake was that you should not confuse large market share and a good hardware brand with the existence of strong, durable, structural advantages. So next up, we've got Amazon with a weight of 4.65% in my portfolio. And my two line thesis here is that Amazon might be the most multi business in the world. It's a combination of both tangible and in intangible modes. Clearly Amazon's prime at AWS and third party businesses are businesses with very lucrative economics. Amazon is known for its day one business culture, known for constantly re-innovating itself. And I think Amazon still has quite some room for margin expansion left. Then we've got IAC with a weight of 6%. Again, we've got a very talented management team with Joey Levin and Barry Diller as the chairman of the company. I think Barry Diller in particular has a phenomenal track record. Arguably, IAC is a collection of average businesses. So I'm not really a fan of the business quality that you, that you can find within the IAC umbrella. But the company is just too cheap, in my opinion, if you do a sum of the parts valuation. And so I think there's very little downside, which is very important in investing. I think the two most valuable assets under the IAC umbrella are Turo and MGM. And then on, on top of that, you've got the Angie and media businesses, as well as maybe the search business, which function as cash cows to fund future acquisitions. All right, then the fifth largest position in my portfolio is Alphabet, aka Google, with a weight of around 6.5%. And here the thesis is that Alphabet is basically operating in the digital advertising duopoly with Matter, and maybe you might throw Amazon in there as well. Clearly, Google has a monopoly in search. It has strong cash generation capabilities in a growing industry. The cloud business of Google is growing and just turned profitable. The valuation that Google is trading at is quite reasonable. I think one of the most underappreciated advantages of Google is its distribution advantage, which, which I think will also give them an advantage in the AI race. And Google itself can be considered a cognitive referent. That's a concept that Dennis Hong has coined. And put simply, it just means that Google is essentially used like a verb, just like Netflix. Airbnb or Uber are used as verbs, which is quite indicative of the existence of a strong mode. All right, then we've got Nintendo. Here the pitch is that Nintendo is one of the best entertainment businesses in the world. Obviously, video gaming enjoys secular tailwinds. I think it's pretty much impossible to replicate the IP that Nintendo possesses. I think it's the most valuable IP in the entire video game industry. Just look at the 
acquisition price that Microsoft was willing to pay for Activision Blizzard and you get an idea of, of what Nintendo might actually be worth. Management of Nintendo is quite vocal about their idea of building an IP flywheel. They are expanding to movies, theme parks, merchandise and, and many other areas which will make the IP only stronger. All right, three more businesses to go. Then we've got Interactive Brokers, which I only added to my portfolio in late 2023, and it's already the third largest position in my portfolio. And I should say that I think Interactive Brokers is just a fantastic business run by a fantastic management team that is underappreciated by the market. So just like many other businesses in my portfolio, Interactive Brokers is run by its founder, Thomas Petterfy. I think the business culture at Interactive Brokers is quite unique because it's all about automation, which is definitely one of the reasons why Interactive Brokers is posting the highest margins of all the businesses in my portfolio. Like I would have to double check, but I think they reached almost 70% operating margins, which is absolutely nuts. So what else did I write down? Well, clearly IBKR is operating a scale economy shared business model. I think there's a lot of runway for above average growth left for the company, both under the IBKR brand in its white label business and management frequently also highlighted that they are open to acquisitions, but they seem to be quite selective, which is a good thing and haven't found an opportunity available at an attractive price. A nice side benefit of the investment is that it essentially functions as a higher interest rate hedge because the business, unlike many other businesses, actually benefits from a high interest rate environment. The company has low custom acquisition costs, which is reflected in the margin profile. And with that, let's focus on Wix.com, my second largest position. Here's the investment thesis. Wix.com is the leading website building solution. It has by far the most com comprehensive suite of solutions in the market. It's founder-led, it's capital-led, it's a high margin business. Since two years or so, management is very focused on profitability. Basically, they turned on a switch, just all of a sudden made the business profitable. Profitable. They are even more profitable than they themselves anticipated at the current moment in time. There's good growth in the business. There's a lot of growth left in the business, especially in the partners business of Wix that has shown very strong growth in the most recent past. I think Wix is destined to take away market share from WordPress here over time. And I think the two biggest competitive advantages that Wix possesses are first of all, switching costs. It's just very hard to switch once you have built a website with their tools. And the Wix.com brand is also associated with a lot of positive attributes. And then finally, I think most people who watch my videos quite regularly will know that my biggest position is Meta. Here's my investment thesis. Meta is the leading digital ad business. It's posting 50% operating margins in its core business. It's basically a cash cow to fund all future investments. There are strong secular tailwinds to the digital advertising industry. Meta is run by one of the best CEOs in the world who is as hungry as ever. I think the business culture of Meta is quite unique. They are definitely willing to move very fast and quote unquote break things. Zuckerberg has once again proven this when he made the company much leaner ever since late 2022, if I remember correctly. And there are various growth drivers for the future, namely threats, WhatsApp, AI, the metaverse, you name it. All right, obviously any critical feedback would be much appreciated. I would also like to know if you could only pick one of the stocks that I mentioned in this video, which one would you pick? Which one like do you like the most? And if you actually want to learn yourself how to do your due diligence, how to truly understand a company, how to follow clear and proven processes, to build a high quality portfolio that will allow you to beat the market over the long term and build wealth, well, check out my mentoring program. You can find quite a few video testimonials on my YouTube channel and a ton of written testimonials on the website that you can find in the description box down below. Yeah, and I guess that's it. Let me know if you enjoyed the video. Take care.